Okay, so good morning. So today is really the first lecture of this course. And we will start with uh, with a uh, fun uh, fun game, which is uh, uh, basically to ask what can the answer be. We will pose a couple of questions and we will answer them. And the spirit would be that we try to answer them with put uh, with a bunch of uh, inputs. Okay, so. So that's the that's the setup, and at one level the the rigor etc. This would be at the level of a very good high school student, but the results would be much more uh, interesting for us. Okay, and uh, so there are two uh, two uh, uh, two concepts or ideas which I need to explain. So one is that of homogeneity. So here you could say of a sample, for instance. So uh, can someone tell me what does it mean to say that a sample is homogeneous or something is homogeneous? What does that mean? The density is homogeneous and composition is homogeneous. What does that mean? What does homogeneity really I mean? mean? I mean uh, it is uh, space independent, like same everywhere. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Okay, so independent of where you are. Okay, more uh, more specifically, it's independent of coordinates, right? So. The next idea is that of a uh, concept is of isotropy. So what does isotropy mean? No directionality. No preferred direction. Okay. So that is the no preferred direction. But we can be more sophisticated and say that it's invariant under rotations. Okay. And here we could say invariance under translations. Okay. Is this is this idea clear? Okay. So yes, sir. Are there any sir, comments? Just just wanted to confirm, but uh, does homogeneity imply isotropy? No. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Even, I mean, the point is that uh, if you say it's isotropic, at, uh, I mean, so for instance, you can have isotropy with a very special point, right? I mean, one point, but if you change that point, that isotropy may be gone. Okay, so these are independent statements because you can also see in terms of group theory, right? One is translations, one is rotations. In that sense. Okay, good. Good question. Okay, so. <clears throat> So now we will come to what we want to study. And so let's uh, try to choose a nice color. Forget it. Stick to these two colors, boring colors, but it's okay. So this is supposed to be a box. Okay of uh, fairly large, as large as you want, large box of volume, capital V, containing capital N particle, identical particles. Okay. So this is our, this is the setup. 
is this clear okay and what we are going to do is to ask two questions about this system okay so the first question ah, one more thing we will assume so uh, so the idea here is we will assume that the system is in equilibrium and i have to explain what it means okay so <clears throat> so the so coming back to this thing so we could for instance have a particular configuration where all, we start off with all the particles in say in one corner of this box all of them you know and particles in there and it's empty everywhere that's a pretty weird configuration and but what will happen is if you wait long enough what happens is that because these particles are not supposed to be stationary they are hanging there they all have velocities so they are moving around there are collisions etc eventually what will happen is that what started off like this will be will get distributed uniformly and you will achieve some kind of equilibrium so for instance uh, if you try to measure so so for instance uh, example you try to ask you you can ask two questions for instance we could do, you can for instance uh, suppose we try to measure the density the number density of particles we can do it two ways okay method 1 is pick a small volume v okay and count the number of particles in that volume inside that volume at say 100 different times okay then what is the density number density we'll call this rho and let's put a subscript t to remind us that we're doing an average over a temporal average this would be let's say there was n1 n2 plus dot 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 plus n100 divided by 100 times v small v sorry right is this procedure clear so what is happening is as a, you know at instant 1 there will be such a n1 number of particles then you wait a little bit time and at time 2 you measure again some particles left some new particles came in the number changed it there will be fluctuations but we are interested in average we are average right things so we do this right this makes sense right yes mm. yes sir. okay so we'll call this uh, we'll call this method we'll call this the time or temporal average. time or temporal average i am picking density as an example but there are any other quantities you want to measure you could do that okay the second one second method is the following pick Hundred locations in the sample, in the volume, distinct of course. Hundred locations in the volume, and choose sub volumes with volume little v again. Same. This see these two v's are the same. Okay. and uh, choose uh, choose sub volumes v at each of them okay so now what we are going to do is again i can define rho but i'll call it e i'll give it a subscript e and so now again i will do the same thing n1 now counts the number of particles in location 1 n2 counts the so we are doing this at the same time 
okay, at the same time. Okay. So it's a computation which is similar to what we did in one, but what N1 to N100 stand for is different. Take that average and divide by B. Hello, sir. Yeah. So we took the time average uh, when the sample is in equilibrium, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying first I'm describing two processes and then I will define for you equilibrium. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I haven't defined equilibrium yet. Is this, is this procedure clear? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So the formula looks the same, but what we are doing is different. And this we will give it a different name. Okay, we will call this. We'll call this E stands for ensemble, which is collection. Okay. Okay. Is this clear? What an ensemble average is? You make a collection of identical sub sub samples and you do those computations in each one of them. Take the average. This is what this is what it means. Okay. So, for instance, I need they need not have the same volume. Okay. They could have had V1, V2, but we make it very simple. We make it ideal. Okay. Sir, it is like spatial average then, ensemble average. Ensemble is in this case spatial average, but we will we will uh, we will use a slightly more advanced notation later. So yeah, here it is just spatial average. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So so we will say. that the system is in equilibrium if temporal and ensemble averages agree. Okay, so in our, for our specific computation, for instance, we were, it, is, it implies that rho t should be equal to rho e. Okay, so you can see that the initial configuration, which I started out saying that all the particles are in one corner, this will not hold, right? I mean, for a long time, you can, if you go to some faraway corner, it will take, you know, and uh, you do your temporal average, you will get zero quite often <laughs> because there are no particles there. And it will take, so only when you reach, so this is something which will happen once your system reaches equilibrium. So that's a system far away from equilibrium and we are approaching. So, so roughly this is the scenario, this is what one means by your system being in equilibrium. Okay, so this is what we're going to assume is, uh, is, uh, is the case in this example. Okay, so this is a uh, system is in equilibrium. So now we are kind of ready to ask the two questions. Okay, so question one is the following. So what is the probability of finding a particle with velocities in the range, in the ranges So, so this is a probability density, if you wish. Okay. So what we will say, so this, so, so this is the question which we want to answer. Okay. So what we have is in moment in velocity space. So this is like a, a cube of 
uh, cube, not cuboid, or whatever. Okay, this, uh, so what is the probability of finding it inside those things in that thing? So let's just say that let's use some notation. Let's call that thing Px, Px, Vy, Vz. And let me put, be very, very pedantic and write something like this. The most general thing, okay, would have been something like this. Dvx, Dvy, Dvz, Dx dy dz okay so this is the probability of finding the particle with velocity inside that cuboid which i just described and similarly at a point x y z with some sizes delta i dx dy dz so this is what it would be but we're going to assume our system is homogeneous okay so, so what does it yeah, go ahead. So what is P? P hat, this is the probability. Okay. Probability density to be precise. P hat. And I put a hat because I will remove that. I'll put something else. Okay. Now we know, we are told that the system is homogeneous. The volume, there's homogeneity. What will that imply? It is constant for all x, y, and z. It will be independent. So this p hat should be independent of x, y, and z. Okay. Right? It shouldn't matter where you are measuring it. So I will now call it p tilde, but now it's only a function of vx, vy, vz. And really dx, dy, dz doesn't matter. We could integrate that out and get some volume factor or whatever. So really, because that system is homogeneous, it's sufficient for us to consider this uh, the so we'll get p tilde now is only a function of three variables and this follows from homogeneity but now we are told that the system is isotropic as well from isotropy we can say that it will only depend upon the speed and not upon the component of okay yes the okay. exactly so we will just define now a capital p of v square okay now because there's a square root involved i prefer to use v square okay p of so this isotropy implies that it has to be absolutely right okay there's no preferred direction so it has to depend on this so is this point clear so the probability so using the uh, ideas of homogeneity and isotropy we are saying that our sample is that way and so why is this square it's, i couldn't understand oh v square uh, because uh, because uh, square root is a non analytic function i prefer writing so vx v square is square root of vx square plus vy square plus vz square oh okay i just want to have that. Okay. okay so this is what we get but now, uh, so this is, and now the, so the, so, the, so we get a very nice uh, formula, but now let's think of it slightly differently. Okay. So, so, but uh, the thing is we can ask what about, uh, one thing we do know is that the uh, X, Y, Z directions are kind of independent, right? So we can ask. What is the probability of finding let P of Vx be the dVx be the probability of finding the particle with x component of momentum <coughs> taking value Vx in the range Vx and Vx plus delta. Right? That is the probability of that. Let's define it this way. But now the the thing is, isotropy tells you there's nothing special about this. So if you ask the same question for y, what will be the answer? For the y direction, what is the probability of... Uh, so I'm giving you the answer for the x direction and I'm asked, the question is, 
what is the answer for the probability of finding the particle with its y component of velocity taking value vy and being in the range vy to vy plus dvy so p of vy into dv same so the key point here it's the same function Okay, similarly for Z also. This is the range. You agree? So we have only one function, but uh, okay, I'm using. So just one uh, notation, which I mean, if I mess up you, so that you don't get confused. Capital P is what I use here. I'm using lowercase p here. Okay, I'll try to be consistent. Is this clear? Okay. But from this also we can put together and ask what is the probability of finding the particle in uh, which we asked earlier inside the cube of uh, with sides dvx, dvy, dvz and that, uh, that will give you the same. You just have to multiply this because like I said you expect that there is no correlation between the velocity in the x direction and the y direction and the z direction. Okay, and you also know this in some sense uh, because when you have collisions, etc., nothing changes. Those things don't. I mean, uh, the the conservation of momentum applies separately in the x, y, and z direction, right? So we know that. Okay, so that so so, so we get another formula which is just the product of this. which is the same as this, the same probability gives the same probability density as what we got earlier, which is P of V square, P V X, P V Y, P V Z. These two have to be equal because they're answering the same question. So we need to find a pair of functions with this property. Okay, is this clear? So I'll pause here for questions. I think I waited long enough. Nobody's answering. <laughs> Sir. Yeah. Sir, yes. Um, uh, what will be the pro the probability that a particle is between Vx and Vx plus Dx uh, mm. is given by PVx dVx. Correct. If this PVx like integrated over all other variable other than other than this Vx. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that will also work. Yeah, I know what you're saying. What you're saying is uh, you equate uh, equate this with this. And you integrate over, say, dBy, all values, minus infinity to plus infinity or whatever, right, of dBx, dBz, okay, and beta, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is, uh, yeah, but I'm using a stronger constraint. This is stronger than that. I don't have to integrate anything yet. Okay. Yeah, what you're saying is correct. That's correct. Okay, so now the question is, we need, uh, what this is telling you is that we need a pair of functions, which uh, one is capital P, and the other is little p, okay, uh, such that uh, this uh, this thing holds. It looks looking pretty hard. So let's just do one thing, okay. Take the log. But I, I, what we will see in a moment is actually there's only one function which has this property, and it has one free parameter. That's all. Okay, there exists one one pair of one. Actually, there's only one pair of. Okay, so let's just see what. Else. Okay, so let's take log. So this implies log of p of v square equal to log of p v x plus log of p v y plus 
log of p of pz. And now take a derivative. With respect to Vx. Okay, so these two terms will drop out, but we'll get something here. So we get P by dvx of log of Pv square. Actually, do I need to take the log? Yeah, let's take the log. Better. If this is equal to P by of V square chain rule times v, uh, d by d of v square by this 2vx. Okay, this is just d by dvx of v square. This should be equal to My handwriting is getting bad every day. You agree with this? Okay. So now what I'll do some rearranging and then you will see. So then I can rewrite this as d by d v square of log of d of v square equal to, I'll take the 2 vx to the other side, 1 by 2 vx d by, I'm putting ordinary derivatives because these are only functions of one variable now. Which I can further simplify as Okay, you agree with this computation? Okay, but now this is, uh, now let's look at this. What can we say left hand side is a function of? Don't look at the right hand side. LHS is a function of what variable? It's a function of one variable only. RHS? Yes. Now, what does that mean? They both are constant. Exactly. That's the only solution. Constants actually an agree. <laughs> Uh, both are identical constants, not just. Okay, so let's write that. Let uh, be equal to, and for some purpose, we'll see in a moment why I put a minus sign. I want alpha to be positive. So let's say that this is true. So this implies that P of V square is proportional to, there's a constant of integration which will remove, which is, which you can use from normalization to the E power P. Similarly, P of Vx will be proportional to E power minus. Okay, so we are done. We have solved. So we found two unique functions and this proportionality constant, how do you fix it? Normalization. Normalization. End of story. So we are done. So there's nothing much to do here. Okay, so what we get now is that P of V square equal to is proportional to Y to one right? I let you work out the proportionality constant it's equal to E power minus alpha v square which i will write as vx square plus vy square plus okay and so what it says 
is that your box, which what are the conditions we 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 said it's in equilibrium, it's homogeneous and isotropic, okay? So what it says that it says that the particles will uh, will have a distribution, a velocity distribution, which will be parameterized by one parameter alpha, okay? And you can see here from normalization, if alpha were, uh, you know, if I put my, if I, uh, the reason I put a minus sign is because we want normalizability, right? You know that, okay? So because of that, that's why alpha is some positive constant, okay? It turns out, so we will see, what is this, uh, this, uh, this distribution called? You must have seen this somewhere. Anybody know a name for this? Maxwell Boltzmann speed distribution. Yeah, so this is called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so far it's a mathematical statement, but what we will see that this is a, this has physical input also. This alpha parameter should be some property of that gas, right? What is that property? We will see in this course. that alpha will be something like m by 2kbt okay so m m here is the mass of a particle uh, kb is boltzmann's constant and t is the temperature so alpha contains the uh, data of the temperature so you can see that the, the velocity distribution of this homogeneous isotropic gas of particles or a collection of particles in equilibrium is can be parameterized by one parameter called the temperature okay i can call alpha the temperature because it is related to the temperature is this clear so this is something which we just by simple uh, minded arguments we have come up to. okay is this point clear yes sir okay very good so now we'll move on to, so I'll pause here to get to the second question. And one more thing to do, uh, look at these questions is they're telling you that probabilistic methods are quite powerful. They let you address things with just a certain amount of limited input. We are not particularly like, like I mentioned in the introductory lecture, we are not interested in the individual trajectories of particles, nor are we interested in the coordinates, how they are evolving. We are much more, we are interested in much more simple overall average features and these are the kind of things and that it sort of fixes things. Okay. So, the question. So, I'll pause here for questions. Or even comments, you know. Okay. So now we will do question two. Sir, I wanted to make a comment about yes. that. Uh, someone, yes. someone said that uh, ensemble average to be special average. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a comment on that. That mm -hmm. uh, we could we could also take. I mean, the same setup for uh, like same initial conditions, um, and many of them, and take a average. Uh, yeah. So, so exactly. that won't uh, be a special average. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so what I'm saying, but here we were asking a very specific kind of question, and this ensemble, I was willing to accept it as spatial average, but yeah, yes, correct, yes. it is not going to be always there. So what we will mean by the ensemble, we have to define it, okay? We will define it, and it will become more clear. Yeah, you're right, it's not going to be always spatial average. Okay, good. So... So the que second question is the following. What we want to ask is, we'll again pick a small volume. V, which is located inside the, is sitting inside this big volume. And we want to ask, what is the probability of finding m particles in a small volume. 
Okay. So this is the kind of question we have in mind. And of course, uh, the volume V, uh, little V, need not be that small, you know. Not, uh, you know, we don't want it to be comparable to the size of the particles of inside. We want it uh, much more. So uh, uh, I think all we need is uh, little V beings. When this so this is the question that we would like to answer. And the answer is pretty simple. So, so we will model it in the following. It's a model. Okay. And I'll tell you the following. So, uh, so let's draw this picture. Again, uh, this box here is uh, meant to be a, a, you know, fairly big box. And it's meant to be in 3D, but I'm just drawing it as a square for simplicity. Okay. So apologies for that, but... Uh, I'm sure your imagination is better than mine. So, okay, so this is the volume, and inside that we'll pick a, another small volume, and we want to ask how many particles. What is the probability of getting n particles inside this box? Okay. So this is the question. So the model is the following. So we'll say that. So we'll say. E of M, finding m particles okay inside this volume v yes, sir. okay i'm not going to define so this is just now it is not probability density it's a simple probability it's a probability of finding uh, uh, m particles in this thing and so the thing is that there are capital n particles totally so what we have, we, what we want is a situation where there are little m particles in this little volume and, but it also means that the rest of them are outside. Okay. So what we will do is we will, we will assign like a coin tossing, we'll assign a probability. What is the probability of finding a particle in that? Uh, this thing we'll say it's just, so we, let me write a formula and then we will. There's a binomial coefficient, NCM, but I, this is a modern convention. Okay, so can someone explain what I've written? The probability of finding a single particle inside the volume V is a uh, small V by capital V. Correct. And like the number of ways, number of combinations in which we can do that is uh, uh, capital N C M. Yeah. And we have put it in the binomial distribution. Exactly. Okay. And uh, this 1 minus V by uh, capital V power N minus M is also, we require that the other particles are outside the thing. Okay. So you can think of it like a coin tossing experiment with probability little v upon getting heads if you wish. So what is the probability of getting? So we mapped it into a coin tossing problem, but with a probability which is natural to so here you can see that the probabilistic methods are quite powerful in telling us, okay, so this is what we get. And so this is the binomial distribution. Again, this is a mathematical model, but we were interested in a slightly more uh, uh, thing. We want to get to a system, so we want to take a limit. And what is the limit? And this is a standard sort of thermodynamic, what we will call the thermodynamic limit. Sir, how limit. is small v by capital V the probability for one particle to be in that volume? So, so you, you, there are, you, you have m, by, your capital n particles, forget all of them, keep one of them, okay? And you randomly put it into this box. So what is the chances of finding it? So this is like a uniform model so that the particle can be is found uniformly everywhere in the box. That's an assumption. Okay, I understand. That is that is why it's a model. 
Okay, but this model is justified from uh, from homogeneity because there's no okay. special point; only uniform is allowed. So there's only one compatible with that. So we are not. Uh, so now we want to take the thermodynamic limit, and the thermodynamic limit is the following: you take v to infinity, take n to infinity, but you want to keep that number density rho, which is capital N by v equal to constant. You don't want to change. Okay, so this is what we want. So we should just go ahead and let's rewrite this in terms of uh, rho. We want to trade capital V for rho, and then take the limits. Okay, so let's do that. That's P of m v will become n choose m. Okay, so so we had little v by the capital V. What I will do is write this rho v by n. Okay, so so now I want to take the limit, which I'll write this a little bit. Uh, I'll rewrite this again. So we are keeping little m fixed, and we are going to take limit. So you can see that this n power m and the n which came from the numerator of the binomial thing, this goes to one. This is one. These remain the same. But let's look at this. Uh, this minus m is uh, as n capital goes to n to infinity, keeping little m fixed and going to infinity. So, can someone tell me what this is? E power rho v by n. Yeah, e power minus rho v. Minus yes. Okay, so this is. Okay. So in the thermodynamic limit, what we get is a different distribution, and this distribution has a name. Does have you seen this before? Poisson. Yeah. Okay, it's called the Poisson. So in the thermodynamic limit, this is much more natural. And what is again very nice about this, like we saw that the velocity distribution was uh, given in terms of uh, it was given in terms of uh, the temperature and other parameters in the problem. Here you can see that the distribution is given in terms of a macroscopic quantity, which is the density. And of course, what we are also told is that there is a little v, and Poisson distribution is interesting. That uh, it's one where the uh, the mean and the standard deviation both are equal, and equal to the parameter. So Poisson distribution with parameter. Again, there is one parameter, v. Okay. So so what we get. Is by just simple-minded arguments, we're able to use probability and come up with nice, uh, you know, nice way of describing uh, properties of our uh, of our system. And we find that there are some unknown, undetermined parameters or whatever which get related to physical quantities. Okay, and so these are the physical observables. You know, so so you can't. You can't. You cannot say that uh, if you give me a box, I can give you the probability distribution. You need to give me at least some parameters. You have to. You have to do one measurement. Same thing here, right? We have to do one measurement of uh, 
of uh, of the density sometimes you have to do somebody has to tell you the density otherwise you don't know the answer so that's where physics comes in it but mathematics when combined with physical input gives you a very nice cross form answer and you get some unknown parameters and these parameters are physics have physical interpretation so this is what i wanted to uh, this is what i wanted to tell you from uh, okay so this is what i wanted to emphasize from this exercise but you can see how it's a, it looks like a very simple minded exercise you can explain it to a high school kid i don't think high school kid can derive it but they can understand this but what uh, what from our view point it tells you how to use statistical methods to model your systems okay so the uh, so this is what i wanted to uh, emphasize in today's lecture and but the, we can say a little bit more you know for instance look at the second problem we can talk about not just average density we can talk about fluctuations in density density standard deviation etc and so when you have a statistical model you can do better than just talk about average quantities we can talk about fluctuations in them okay so what we will see is that in thermodynamics will be about the uh, in the middle of this course when we discuss thermodynamics you'll see the thermodynamics is about average quantities but statistical mechanics can tell you a lot more okay it can give you things about fluctuations etc and which uh, which cannot be done from thermodynamics okay thermodynamics you can tell it will tell you something about fluctuations i mean it will tell uh, i mean so stability of your system will give you some inequalities so you can get some inequalities but it won't tell you what the value so when you have a model in statistical mechanics you can do more than that you can about fluctuations okay so i am done with today's lecture and uh, so I, this was also a way to introduce you to several distributions so we have seen three distributions so the uh, basel boltzmann distribution is the normal or the gaussian distribution and we have seen the binomial distribution and we have also seen the poisson distribution so so of course there are many 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 more distributions but uh, we will see a different problem which which uh, which has nothing to do with a gas but has to do with spins on some uh, system and if you are studying the spin of the system again we will find uh, we can use probabilistic methods similar to binomial etc but there the uh, there the parameters will mean something else okay so if it's going to become poisson it will become poisson but there will be the parameter that will mean something else just because everything which is poisson doesn't mean the poisson parameter is rho v okay poisson parameter could be whatever is relevant to that particular problem okay and so that uh, i think that will be your first problem set which will come later today okay worst case scenario by tomorrow so i'll pause here for questions and then we can end the end the lecture rather sir uh, you took density to be constant right no rho Uh, no rho was just defined no no rho is not defined to be constant i mean rho was defined to be the number rho by n by v yeah, sir but isn't that uh, position dependent on the system like no, at no, different no at different I, points in the system the density might assumed, be different then it's not homogeneous uh, yeah yeah right hmm? okay but here when i am defining i'm just saying that it's just n by v and for the limit i'm saying i keep rho constant that's it okay and but again the point here is that there are, this does not mean this rho being a fixed number doesn't mean there are no fluctuations and and that's what this is saying right i mean you can go back and you can ask what is the fluctuations you can you can find out you're not going to every time you go and measure you're not going to get rho v particles right on an average you will get rho v number of particles. Rho times little v. So, uh, so we are ignoring those small fluctuations. We are not ignoring. This not ignoring. Because you said it is homogeneous. So, uh, if it is like, uh, uh, if it is homogeneous, then it should be. No, no. Rho you v. go but back and think about what we what it said, what we said earlier. I said uh, when you go to measure density, right? You go and measure in, uh, you know, uh, you measure uh, you a certain number of times and find the average. That's all one said. Okay. Okay, so it's not saying that there are no fluctuations. Of course, of course, there can be, there will be, 
you know that right you sit in you're sitting at one point and you're in that you're sitting inside that volume and you're counting number of particles particles are coming going i mean so uh, the number will be keep keep changing but if you measure the average if you take the temporal average you will get rho times v okay so if you really says that that number will be fixed the average will fix okay. it doesn't say that every instant then the, the the only way that can happen is if you have you know particles without motion stuck here even that's not correct right that's not what is happening particles are in motion so that's what i'm saying there are fluctuations with uh, respect so it's yes. like two quantities are tending to infinity and their ratio is uh, a constant no, then that is different yeah yeah that that is okay that is just some limit we are taking but i'm saying something uh, i mean even she is asking something different which is that uh, look uh, if you sit somewhere there will be fluctuations no sir my question was if like two quantities are tending to infinity and their uh, ratio is constant then such kind of limit is called as thermodynamic limit or no i mean yeah, yeah so uh, thermodynamic limit is taking the infinite volume limit in some sense but you don't want to just take things to infinity by keeping number constant then it becomes very very dilute gas you're changing the setup what you want to do is to take you want to make it big but not change something right you have to do that properly so that's why you have to take n also to infinity otherwise the the problem is changing okay yeah so so yes didi so i was asking like there is no constant on small v right it can be anything yeah but it should be small like atomic size okay yeah so then uh, like uh, we answered first question can it be uh, linked to this one also which first question uh, the probability which we calculated in the first which we got to be maxwell boltzmann yeah but that is uh, for the velocities this is about space okay. part we are asking so okay. yeah yeah we can combine these results they are not they don't both are for the same system uh, they're just asking different questions Yeah, it's the same system. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sir, so the size of V should be uh, considerably smaller than capital V, also, right? Yeah. For our model to make sense. Sir, at initially, while we are defining equilibrium, we have thought. You have said that at the corners. No, uh, no, no, no. The corner I was, I gave you a special instance which is not in equilibrium. Okay, oh, what we want, right? Okay, okay, okay that was the case where it's not in equilibrium. <laughs> okay. Uh, another thing, um, in in later part of the derivation, we have assumed a particle can a we can find a particle with uniform probability in the whole volume of the Box. Yeah, the probability it's in the box. The probability of finding the particle in the box is one. Yes, and in do you, when you are finding this Maxwell uh, distribution, mm -hmm. uh, no, that kind of assumption. Yeah. Go ahead. Have we taken that kind of assumption? It like in uniformity uh, of finding I, particle everywhere as. No, no, I, because that's not a, uh, the uh, question. One has nothing to do with spatial. It's only about uh, only about momenta or velocities. Oh, okay. 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 So we will see how to do all of them together. Okay. Maybe next class we'll be doing something. Okay. So next class we'll be discussing what is the state of a statistical mechanical system. So. Uh, yeah we have design models assuming that the system attains equilibrium immediately but if there no we are not saying immediately we are waiting long okay. enough till it attains so so in so, this course we are not asking the approach to equilibrium okay. and stuff like that okay so there can be different models for the phase where there is non equilibrium oh yeah yeah no that's much harder problem that's much harder so we are doing things uh, we have assumed that uh, you know equilibrium has been attained and then we are discussing equilibrium properties So what we are doing in this course is equilibrium statistical mechanics. Much much simpler problem. Yeah. Okay. Sir. Thank this you. itself is rich. <laughs> okay. I'll stop recording.